All right. So welcome to the whole body migraine assessment call. So if you haven't watched any of these before, the whole idea behind these is the fact that conventional approaches to migraines overly simplistic, right? Doesn't take into account any of the biochemistry and the research that we know underlies our migraines. There is so much that we know. And by just do, doing a, a short little evaluation of a, a very common set of symptoms, we can really identify some of those underlying issues that are going on and target those biochemical pathways so that we actually have effective treatment, even in people who have had migraines their entire lives or have you know struggled with them for 20 plus years and nothing seems to work. So today we have Candice C, who has graciously shared some of her symptoms with us. And so we're going to go through those and take a look at the symptom patterns that I'm seeing for her and some of those underlying pathways that are out of balance that once she works on getting those up and running, um, then she should start seeing some improvement in her symptoms. So let's get started. So Candace says that she started having her migraines about 18 years ago after she was pregnant. She has about 20 migraine days a month. She had a hysterectomy, so she doesn't notice any cyclical component necessarily, but spoiler alert, there's absolutely a hormonal component to this, right? Um, she struggles with constipation and recurrent UTIs. Uh, medications that help include Rayvow, uh, which helps to boost serotonin and, and it uh, causes blood vessel constriction. And um, she also has anxiety, seasonal allergies, and asthma. The last little piece that she shared is that caffeine makes her symptoms better, her, her migraines better, and heat will trigger them. So there's a, obviously there's more than one thing going on. There always is in the complex cases, right? And that's why a single type of medication is just not going to be effective for migraine control. So Candice, in your case, what we're looking at here is there absolutely is a hormonal component to it. The very first clue is the fact that your migraine started after you became pregnant, right? And so um, you might have had the hysterectomy hoping that that would resolve the problem. However, um, apparently it hasn't. And I'm going to guess that your hormonal symptoms are actually going to be from estrogen and progesterone deficiency issues. So progesterone is a neurosteroid. It helps to reduce inflammation in our brain. And when we become deficient in that for one reason or another, then we actually will start seeing problems from that. Um, when we have kids, our progesterone during pregnancy will spike. And in a lot of cases, migraines will resolve for that reason although it can actually worsen problems because then the body sees it as an estrogen deficiency. So that actually gives us a very important clue. If you have had pre uh, migraines all through your pregnancy when progesterone levels are really high, we know that for you, there absolutely is an estrogen deficiency problem going on that's contributing to migraines. Now, if you're in the opposite camp where you had migraine, uh, completely migraine free during your entire pregnancy, and then they came back hard after you had gave birth, then we know that you have uh, very much a piece of low progesterone that's triggering your migraines. Okay. And that has to do with the, how the hormones shift during pregnancy. Now, I don't know the specifics for you, but from what I can tell, um, because of the fact that the, um, the Rayvow and um, some of the constipation UTI issues, um, some of the anxiety, there's most likely a deficiency picture in both estrogen and progesterone for you. And those that imbalance there, those deficiencies are going to be contributing. Um, unfortunately, the hysterectomy probably contributed to some of that because actually we know that our, um, our uterus will produce estrogen for us in certain quantities, um, which can actually help to kind of stabilize things. Um, but that, you know, that being said, I don't know why you had the hysterectomy. So it was obviously uh, a necessary um, procedure for you. But taking a more in-depth look at what's going on from your hormones, and I'm not talking about blood testing, because the problem with blood testing hormones is that we're not actually getting um, the low end information, right? We can only really tell from, from blood testing. Um, well, that's not necessarily true. Let me back up for a minute. What we know from blood testing is that if you do it at a certain time of your cycle, we do have reference ranges. Most of the time, your doctor doesn't tell you to go in at a certain point in your cycle. They just say, here, go take your lab. You take your labs. They don't even ask where you were in your cycle. And they're like, oh, well, you're within normal range. 
Well, yeah, except that you might not be for the point of the cycle that you're in, right? So it's really important to make sure that you know when you go in for blood testing hormones that you know where you're at in your cycle so you can use the appropriate reference range. And that can let you know if you are low or deficient in estrogen or progesterone based on where you are in your cycle. So that can give us a little bit of information. What I always like to do is urine testing, ideally, or some, um, some people really love doing saliva testing. Both of those will give you a much better idea from a um, uh, functional standpoint, what's going on with your hormones. And we're measuring it in a very specific window during your cycle. So we have a better idea of the ratio between your estrogen and progesterone because you can have a normal estrogen and a normal progesterone. But if your estrogen is way up here at the top end of that normal range and your progesterone is way down here at the very bottom end of the normal range, even though it looks like you're within normal range for both of them, that imbalance where your progesterone should be higher than your estrogen, that imbalance is going to show in your body functionally as a progesterone deficiency, meaning that you're going to have a lot of estrogen dominant symptoms one of which can be the anxiety, constipation, um, and you know a lot of really heavy estrogenic, um, like heavy periods, cramping, you know, problem sleeping, things like that. So, um, so you know, do a little bit more testing on the hormone piece and take a look at um, you know possibly doing some bioidentical stuff or some hormone uh, hormone balancing herbs and things. All right. Number two that I saw in here, absolutely there is a vasoactive piece going on. And what that means is that you have some issues with your blood vessels getting too big. They're, they're dilating and that is, that is um, contributing to those migraines. And the way that I can tell that is the fact that the Raywow, which helps to um, constrict blood vessels is helpful um, as you know, triptans in general probably are helpful for you. Caffeine is helpful, which helps with that constriction and heat, which causes vasodilation will trigger a migraine for you. So those things give us some pieces of information there. So taking a look at a couple of different things here. One, the amount of arginine containing foods that you're eating through the day. So arginine is an amino acid that is found in all proteins. So you're not going to get away from it. You can't eliminate it. It's necessary to live. But if you have too much of it for your body is converting into too much nitric oxide, which then is contributing to that vasodilation. So your blood vessels are just constantly staying open instead of opening and closing and, you know, staying in a normal where it should be. And that happens through the biochemistry involved with arginine, forming nitric oxide. And there's actually a gene that contributes to this called the NOS3 gene that again, we have a lot of information about how we can improve that genetic function. So taking a look at, um, taking a look at some of the things that you can do to help support a healthy NOS3 action will be good. Um, but in the meantime, we wanna try to avoid anything that's gonna cause those rebound migraines. So using caffeine all the time, if you're a regular coffee drinker, that should go out the window. Um, do it slowly. We don't want to push you into like a seven week migraine, right? But um, we want to wean you off the coffee and you can actually use that as needed to help abort one. Um, you want to make sure that you're not taking any of your acute medications that help with that vasoconstriction, because then we're definitely going to be seeing a lot of rebound migraines um, for that reason. And then starting to track and being aware of the arginine foods that you're eating, because you might not be aware of it, but I mean, if nuts are a big trigger for you, or if you feel like you feel bad after eating meats or most meats, um, a lot of times it's related to the arginine. So you can choose how, uh, lower arginine foods to, um, to help you uh, get through that a little bit. All right. Um, and then the last piece that I had for you is histamine. So again, with the seasonal allergies and the history of asthma that you have, your body is having a hard time clearing histamine out. So again, there is a gene related to how your body is able to break down histamine. It's called the DAO gene. And you can actually, um, if, you, if you notice that your migraines are worse during seasonal allergy time, then you really need to work on, uh, on that pathway, on that histamine pathway and clearing out the histamine. And again, there are well-known protocols and things. Um, your doctor might not know about it, but naturopathic physicians were trained in that kind of thing. You can find resources um, online that will help to support and show you how to eliminate histamine um, from the body as well as trying to avoid exposure to histamine at least in the short term so that can mean high histamine foods 
Um, that can mean any of your allergens that you know you're allergic to. And that can also mean methylated B vitamins. So any methylcobalamin, any methylfolate, MTH, B12, MTH, uh, MT, uh, MTH folate, any of those things are not going to be good for you until you're able to process the histamine a little bit more appropriate. So you might do a little bit better with something like a hydroxycobalamin or a denosylcobalamin, but you're going to want to check with your doctor about the form of B12 that's going to be most appropriate for you. Okay. So, you know, again, I want to reiterate the fact that we don't want to identify these things and just go on an elimination of histamine and an elimination of arginine. That is not the answer. That is a short-term solution while you work on healing those underlying biochemical pathways. So don't miss that incredibly important third step. We've got the evaluate. I just did that. We've got the eliminate. So then we will need to start eliminating stuff to heal, but you have to get that third piece that, that uh, alleviate in there so that your body starts to heal. You support those biochemical pathways. So then, then your body is able to take over that appropriate, um, uh, metabolism of your hormones and the histamine and the arginine so that you no longer are battling this, right? And uh, an approach from this perspective, from a whole body system systemic approach like this is going to finally get you results as long as you, um, you your doctor understands, you know, how to utilize this information. So, if, uh, if you're watching this and you want more information about this type of individualized biochemical approach to your migraines, then I invite you to watch my free training that goes a little bit more in depth into how we really do this. You can find the link in the description. Until next time.